I love to cook at home, and having good kitchenware makes all the difference in the world. Not only does good equipment make prep and cooking easier, but it makes it more enjoyable. This is why both Joel and I are huge fans of made-in cookware. Their wide range of cookware, from pots and pans to knives and flatware and even glassware, are designed to be professional quality for right in your home. Joel is a big fan of their knife sets, and I just upgraded all of our stock pots and saucepans to made-in stainless steel ones. This goes along with my many other stainless steel, carbon steel pans that I have. I have over a dozen pieces, and I absolutely swear by made-in products. Next, I'm getting a set of beer glasses. Yes, beer glasses for the whole podcast crew. Take your home cooking to the next level by upgrading your cookware by going to unitedwedrink.com slash made in. That's M-A-D-E-I-N. Find out why pros like Grant Ackett's, Sean Brock, Nancy Silverton, and Eric Repair trust made in. Go to unitedwedrink.com slash made in. That's M-A-D-E-I-N and upgrade your kitchen and cooking today. The opinions and statements in this podcast do not represent those of the host's employers, co-workers, family, or imaginary friends. Now enjoy the show. Happy hour? More like amateur hour. Welcome to United We Drink. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the podcast of all podcasts. That's what I'm going with this week. Welcome to United We Drink right here on unitedwedrink.com, as well as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, and wherever fine podcasts are found. My name is Mikey Revich, and, um, you know, probably I should say something about, you know, kids, sleep, all of that, that becoming my my normal intro uh joining us back from super secret uh trip out to sedona to get mystical and hippie-ish and find a new reflective face is joel codner i have not been here for just shy of a month and i feel like I could just tell you guys, you know what? Turn off your mics. I got this. Because in the past 28 days or whatever it was, I have experienced so much, both positive and negative. I feel like I need my own spinoff right now. Well, why don't you go over to our friends at uh, Three Beards Media? Maybe they'll give you a, a show over there. Um. Our friends at Bitter Units, their little spin-off thing. If if I have to explain it, it's not funny. It's called three. That's beers. true. Yeah, their little uh, their company that they broke off their podcast and Old Man Strength too. I'm uh, I I'm explaining how the sausage <laughs> is made, uh, and that's not why you're here. Uh, also, why you're not here, why you are not here, is our other co-host uh, <laughs> is Kevin Abbott. <laughs> I continue to get the best introductions, period, on the United We Drink podcast, but it's an honor and a privilege to be here with you all. And Mike, just a a, uh, a comment, when you are describing somebody else's podcast, network, thing in general, calling it their little such and such, not the best way and not the kindest way to describe it. I, and I'm saying that from personal experience. People go, yeah, you own that little brewery over in Boca Raton. I'm like, yeah, I own the little brewery in Boca Raton, you douchebag. Oh, you're you're from uh, the, the one over on Federal whose uh, uh, initials are uh, a thing uh, that is kind of phallic. That's where you're Come. from. <laughs> um, well, gentlemen, I'm glad that we are back here to make such terrible remarks and to talk about this industry, this beer thing that we are involved in. Um, so 
we're believe it or not, we're not going to talk about modern times uh, on this particular episode because every time that we do, something else happens, and uh, we just sound dumb by the time that this comes out. I think that this is something that we should just jump right into because it was brought up by former co-host of the show, Bill Palmisano, uh, and he wanted us to discuss kind of how our lives have morphed from the beer industry. Like we we've talked many times about like memories and friendships that have been built off of this, but there's other things in our lives as a whole that could change because of this, like uh, maybe a passion behind other beverages, a passion for traveling, cooking, food, music. Um, and I, I think that this is uh, something that I, I would like to talk about because uh, believe it or not, Kevin, like Kevin debated this before that people actually like hearing about us sometimes on this show because that's kind of why they tune in. Um, he, uh, you also wanted to, uh, uh, talk a bit more about, uh, where we see our futures and careers in this industry. Uh, this could potentially turn into a multi-episode thing. Who knows what, not. but let's, let's dive into some of this. Like we, we all met each other in this industry and we're very different people from when we met each other. Uh, is there something outside of just your career in this industry that you think uh, came from being in this industry that you got super into or that has changed your life in a different direction um, outside of beer? I'll, uh, I'll start things off with Joel. <laughs> I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Um, I hated okay, the topic thanks. when guy. Bye. I hated the topic when Phil brought it up. Uh, brought it up. I don't <laughs> fully understand it. It doesn't make sense to me. I feel like most of these things are not correlated, and I generally don't have anything positive to say. So uh, I'm gonna pass to Kevin. <laughs> now you would. Now Great. you would. Great listening uh, going on right here. Now you would think. If anyone fucking tunes in to hear me say anything on this podcast, it's not positive. <laughs> you would think that the conversation, what Joel had just said, would have been said maybe not during recording, maybe beforehand. But that's not how we roll. You, we want you to see exactly what's going on in our minds and exactly how we're going to bring this podcast to you. So I, I, I love that. Thank you, Joel, for, for speaking your mind and, and living your truth. And as you mentioned before we started, uh, I prefer to just wing it. So <laughs> well, I'm well, fine with going along with this. I just don't fully get it. What don't you get? Like, like what? What? <laughs> What fucking, like, what? It's like, okay, yeah, like, I got into, you know, independent craft artisan coffee early in my <laughs> brewing years. But, like, I still buy the Amazon Solimo brand cheap shit on subscribe and save because it's affordable. I'm not getting $15 12-ounce bags of lo locally roasted coffee anymore. I mean... We're in a fucking, I don't even know what you would call this economy, but I'm sure shit not, you know. It's an art right? Coffee tastes like it's... blueberries because it's from Ethiopia. No, it's like fucking glorified Folgers in my Keurig. Sometimes people go on vacation and they come back with a renewed sense of just joy and passion because they've just been out and about and experienced new wonderful things in life and sometimes people come back from vacation and they're just a miserable son of a bitch because they want to be on vacation and they're back to their normal mundane life i got i'll give you two guesses on which one joel is well in all fairness you didn't fairness, get the right crystals when you were in Sedona. God damn it, right? I was just going to say that. <laughs> Did That's you get exactly what I was just going to say? Any le cra crafted leather goods? 
No, but uh, I have uh, tons of turquoise now. I, I just asked you that. What? You said I heard topaz. Oh, the, oh I said topaz. I heard leather My goods. My bad. What about some amethyst? Do you have any of that? Uh, we actually already have tons of amethyst because my wife loves that shit. She always has. Um, yeah, I. Whatever. Uh, no, I. I. Maybe ask me some more specific questions than like this. This fucking existential, like, what has beer done for your life, horse shit. I mean, the, the, I I'm the one who said <laughs> before we even went on the air that this isn't necessarily a positive thing. It can be a negative thing if you want to, if you want to drag it all down. I mean, yeah, that's what I want. We we we, we do it to ourselves all the time. Uh, but I mean, I just came from Taco Night at the In Laws. Trust me, I don't need any more negativity. <laughs> I am also, by the way, so distracted because this entire time I'm watching you chew on something and you were eating pretzels earlier and I'm just waiting for it to be very crunchy. Are you just making liberal use of your mute button or are you now eating a a gummy soft thing? No, I've still got the pretzel crisps. Um, (laughs) Just just muting for your consideration. Uh, I was I was going to go with sunflower seeds is what he he was it moving looked, on oh, to. Go you know, they're not those. <laughs> it looks Seed a little bit Seed people are the goddamn worst. <laughs> Will you get a bag of nuts? <laughs> okay, first of all, Mike, I thought the exact same thing. And second of all, I love sunflower seeds. I, do too. I used to devour them when I was playing baseball as a kid, and they are one of my favorite things in the world and it makes sense because joel and i are either a hundred percent aligned on everything but anything that we are not a hundred percent hundred percent aligned on we are the polar opposites <laughs> <laughs> to a comical degree so that makes sense that not only does he not like sunflower seeds but he wants everyone that likes them to burn in hell <laughs> sunflower I, seeds actually pair really well with a plain favored flavored uh seltzer of you know polar just you know carbonated water and uh also like one of those french independent uh, foreign films <laughs> so mike is this what you call a podcast off the rails is that the terminology we would use uh that that would indicate that we were even on the rails to begin with and that is i don't debatable. even think debatable uh we I, we are not engineers, and we don't know how to put trains on rails, let alone make the rails. So, Phil, are you happy now? <laughs> are you happy of what you've done to Joel and what you've done to this you show? You see what happens? You see when what you happens? try to have nice things? Well, look, uh, wh- why don't you guys... You're killing your father. <laughs> why don't you guys kind of take the lead, and I will try to ease my toes into the waters we're uh, about to traverse here okay because i'm kind of weird about this i i you know what i know i know that joel uh threw it to you kevin but i'll i'll jump in i'll i'll add a little something before giving you the floor in my time now decade in this industry i have I, I, I've grown an appreciation for uh, a, a number of other beverages, like like spirits, things that I, I didn't really get too into before this. Wine, a lot because of my wife, uh, who likes wine. And, and, and actually Kevin, too, because Kevin's uh, very into wine and has taught me a good bit. Uh, in my years but i i think probably the biggest thing is now in my life is coffee i did not drink coffee i hated coffee uh when i became a member of this industry when we all worked together at our first at joel and i's first brewery i hated coffee and i just thought that all coffee was just overly bitter and astringent and didn't taste any good. And I've learned over the years that that's not the case. And I really do enjoy good coffee. And uh, like probably uh, 
a week ago, I had four different bags of coffee, not all by plan, but just was like, oh, this sounds good. I'm buying that online. And I just dropped, I dropped $15 for a 12 ounce bag of beans uh, from some roastery. Uh, But yeah, I, I've developed a, a taste for other things that I really enjoy. And coffee is an important part of my life right now with trying to stay awake and helping raise twins. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think that I have developed different tastes and likes. I mean, travel and cooking and all of that that fill throughout there as options have been things that I've enjoyed before that. But uh yeah, I I did coffee a hell of a lot more now than I did when I first came in. And beer probably helped with that, with having stouts and porters and not even ones that had coffee in them, but uh, learning what those flavors really can be like and then finding good coffee that has similar flavors to beer in them. All right, Kevin, say words stuff things okay so <clears throat> my mentioning the uh, the cooking aspect of things is the biggest one for me i i always enjoyed cooking before i got into the beer industry but my i grew up in a family that owned a restaurant and i worked in it at a very young age i worked at restaurants for from 15 to into my early 30s and always enjoyed food, but I wasn't very good at cooking. I could follow a recipe, but it wasn't anything that I was talented at all in. I probably thought I was when I was in my 20s and early 30s, but becoming a brewer really, it it, it changed the way I looked at flavors and ingredients. And beforehand, I was always a heavy-handed person with ingredients and thought the more the better and my first couple years in brewing kind of reinforced that because of the kind of beers that I was making and then as I evolved and realized that simplicity is almost always better and I remember I probably said this on the podcast before but there was a gentleman named Paul Farnsworth that was a little bit of a mentor to me early on in my career he he told me there's a 3 2 1 rule 3 malts 2 hops 1 yeast when I started to learn that, I tr- I just subconsciously brought that over into my cooking, and I think I became a much better cook to the point now I can just forage through the fridge, through the pantry, and make a pretty good meal just kind of off the top of my head, which is something I never could do before. So I do think that the cooking aspect of it has really changed in a direct way from my brewing experience. The biggest thing that's changed for me, though, in my life, because I had a great appreciation of wine beforehand. I worked as a wine steward for seven years. I had a great appreciation for whiskey. I I did the ordering for a high-end restaurant that had 20 or 30 single malt scotches, and I learned a lot about that beforehand. But the biggest thing is just having a career. I was working in restaurants, and you could call that a career beforehand, but I didn't find something that I'm probably going to do for the rest of my life until until the beer industry. And everything that has come down the pike from my family, home ownership, all those things have sprouted from the beer industry. And that's not a specific skill or anything that I've learned, but it's the biggest life change possible is stability uh, changing my life from being a get get home at four o'clock in the morning working at bars and restaurants to working a normal nine to five kind of job. Something I never thought I would do, didn't think I was made for, didn't think I could do. And lo and behold, now 15 years later, it's just old hat. I have a, I have a comment and then a question for you, Kevin. First comment, you have turned into a very good chef. Uh, oh, thank you, man. And I, like, you have, I second you, that. You have cooked for for me, uh, my wife, my, uh, Joel, uh, like a number of us, a number of times. And you've made things that you've never made before, like specifically thinking of my bachelor party that we had at your home uh, where you made us Dan Dan noodles. You made us uh, curried goat. 
things that you've never made before and you knocked it out of the park uh with Thank each you. of those so um kudos to you for for that uh question is you 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 mentioned uh dr farnsworth and his little three two one how do you is there a translation that you use that towards food because that that or was it just a uh way of thinking more simplistic or like or is the three something to something and the one something to food it's not a direct correlation necessarily, but it's just looking at things simplistically. The best way I can describe it is I made a great red ale, I believe, in the first brewery that I worked at at Funky Buddha uh, called Red Dawn. And at that time, I think I had six malts in the malt bill. It, c- it could have been seven. But as a home brewer, I was like, well, I like C60 and I like C120 and they give different flavors. So I'm going to use both of those. Plus, I'm going to use Maris Otter and uh, I'm going to use Maris and a base two row malt. And I'm going to put in a little bit of roasted barley, uh, just a smidge for some. I just wanted to put every flavor possible that I liked in malty beers into this recipe because I thought that's what would make a beer great. And I would do the same thing when I made a dish. I'd use every spice in my cabinet because I was, well, more spices, the better. When I learned, when I learned uh, more about stripping things down and building things from the ground up and saying, I've got to have a strong foundation and everything has to have a reason for being there. It made me understand building a recipe is something as simple as making a soup. Or making a curry. It's it's really easy to overspice. And it can be delicious, by the way. When you're building a dish, for the first it's 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 very similar to what we talk about with the pastry stouts and the and the smoothie sours. Over the top, in your face flavors are incredible for the first couple bites of a dish. If you use an amazing amount of salt, tons of spices, you use a bunch of fat, you you melt a bunch of butter into a sauce, it's going to taste great. But you might not love your third, fourth, fifth bite. You might not finish the dish. And that mentality that Professor Farnsworth instilled in me as we were talking and he and we weren't I didn't work for him he was just a friend that was in the brewing industry forever and was just imparting these little bits of knowledge on me and it's just kind of infected other aspects of things that I love and I look at sometimes even tv shows and comedy and things that I love artistically that way of how is what's the way to say this simpler what's the way to strip down the extra parts and make this more relatable and easier to digest and get to the heart of the matter of what makes something great. That's, that's brewing. That's what brewing taught me. I I remember an episode of, uh, bitter units, uh, maybe a month or two ago when they had, uh, Joe from hanging hills on and they, Tim and Joe were talking about building recipes for beers. And I can't remember which one of them mentioned how, like, I, I used to, I, I, I can look back at some old recipes and be like, I had seven malts and I'm like, holy fuck, I can cut this down and make this, make this so much more simple, uh, now. And it, it you talking about that just reminded me of that. And I, I, I think there, sure, there, there's probably some beers that you can make that are seven malts, six malts, whatever, and, and be fantastic, but simple is better to me and more impressive to me uh, and, and not that you're trying to impress me don't don't try to impress me who the fuck am i uh but it's i really do love the nuance and the character that comes from using the least amount of stuff in making it um because i'm always just blown away by flavors uh, when you tell me like, oh, I got Pilsner and a caramel malt. Uh, there's, there's a bittering malt and a flavor malt and then yeast. And like, you got all of this from that. It's, it's, it's incredible. And when you, you think about, yeah, uh, dishes that way, uh, in cooking, uh, 
I'm blown away by when I see a, a recipe for something uh, like Vietnamese and like, wow, that's not a whole lot of stuff in there. I would have expected a lot more. And like, no, it's great that there isn't more to it. It's very important what you mentioned about the fact that you can make a really good beer using more than three malts. Yeah. But the important thing is to understand why it's better as the brewer, because you know what it would taste like if you took that seventh malt out or that sixth malt out. What ends up happening to so many is they go, well, I'm just going to build this here from the ground up. I'm never going to experiment with a stripped down recipe. So I don't even know if this flavor comes through. If I put 2% 2 Belgian special B malt in with my two other crystal malts, is it, are you really going to taste that nuance or is that just a hidden flavor that does absolutely nothing to your recipe? And that, that's the thing. Yeah. I, I mean, I, maybe, maybe I'm speaking out of turn or, or uh, too much here, but we'll see. Maybe uh, we'll see what my employment uh, status is after this. But we, in one of our IPAs, we have a bag of C20 and I'm like, is that necessary? Like, <laughs> like, it it doesn't really come across a whole lot in the flavor. It doesn't change the color all that much for a uh, a six and a half percent West Coast IPA. Like, do we need that bag in there? Like, can we take that out and still get as good of a beer, or even just the same beer? Um, I I, I think about things like that too. Joel, do you remember at the brewery all that we all worked together at, there was some rule where every single beer had at least one bag of some malt? Do you know what I'm talking about? Does this care about every here? bag of every batch of beer had one bag of some malt? Well, I'm saying every batch, every single individual beer we made had at least one bag of a particular malt. And it didn't matter if it was a stout, if it was an IPA, if it was ever, there's always one malt that had to be in every single recipe. That's Carapels. a better way to describe it. It was carapace. Okay. Yeah. Um, and it's it's funny that you guys are talking about this because I could swear I've heard a very similar conversation recently. And I don't even remember if it was about beer, but it was about some sort of recipe creation and the idea that there's almost now this arms race toward minimalism, where everyone's going to show off how much they can do with so little and not always to their benefit. You know, because when I hear all this... And there seems to be a lot of trash talk, you know, on, on Twitter and everything among brewers and beer people where they, you know, the, the new thing to mock is like, oh, you've got X amount of fucking malts in, in your shit and, and all that stuff. And, and it's like, I get it. Like, I am I am definitely someone who is more about simplicity and, and making things good but easier and not overdoing it. But in the same token, like... When someone's putting seven malts in their fucking beer, they're not all equal proportion. It's not like it's a thousand pounds of two row and a thousand pounds of rye and a thousand pounds of C20. Like, and it, like Mike was saying, like there may be one bag in this batch. Maybe it makes a difference. Maybe it doesn't. But, you know, that ultimately comes down to brewer's preference. And then ultimately, is it selling well? You know, like do the people who regularly enjoy that, um, you know, are, are they going to notice the difference if you take it out or if you add more or, or whatever? So, um, it, obviously, it's a it, little off track here, but um, I just I, th I thought that was interesting, and 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 just think that while I favor simplicity, I don't think it's always the best, you know, approach. No, like I I look Joel the mild that you and I made uh, at the brew pub, like. Maris Otter, uh, brown malt, uh, chocolate rye. Uh, there's there's two others. I, I feel like in there, like we had probably five malts in in that beer, and for a a beer that's supposed to be a four percent uh, easy drinking beer, but to get the complex flavor from a dark mild, 
those were the malts that we wanted to use to create that. And I, I think that we did a great job with it. And, but yeah, like the chocolate, we, we had to buy a 55 pound bag of chocolate rye. And we, I think there was like five pounds, 10 pounds in the batch of a, yeah, probably. a, a, of a 10 barrel batch of that. Uh, so we didn't use the whole bag, but yeah, there, there are, I feel like the, some recipes that do kind of necessitate some of that, but there are certain dishes there, there, there is this nuance. And, and I, uh, to go back to what you were talking about this, this people now criticizing others for using a whole bunch of like, this is all our fault. America, <laughs> American craft oh, of course. brewery. It's like we're we're the ones who had to do things bigger and better and, and and throw all of this shit into it. And now that we're we're trying to sim- simplify things, we're now shitting on our old selves and shitting on those who are maybe stuck in that. It's it, it's 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 fucking silly. Um, how craft beer will just step on itself. Uh, for advancement at points in time. Well, I feel like a lot of hype brewers started fucking with loggers because they didn't want to be a punchline, you know? And, yeah. And a lot of them made it very immature with the crispy boy bullshit and all that. Uh, one of the things that's important to, to note is we we're giving our opinions on the industry, the kinds of beers we like on a, on a consistent basis here. That's what we're here to do. There are no absolutes on the things that we say. I may say that stripped down and simplistic recipes on average is, is are maybe better or where I'd want to start any beer off at. But that doesn't mean that it's the only way to make a great beer. It's just if I were to give my philosophy, that's where I would start at. There are in, there are incredible beers with tons and tons of ingredients. There are garbage beers with one or two. You still have to have skill. You still have to work at it. You still have to put the effort in and research what you're trying to do if you've never done it before. The the building blocks, if you're building a house, you start with the foundation. When you're building a recipe, you start with the foundation and you build off of that. And if you need to add extra malt and extra flavors and extra hops and, and extracts or adjunct ingredients to make a great beer, great. But how's your foundation? is really what it comes down to for me. And just because you strip things down, if the stripped down ingredients are terrible and put together in a poor way, it's not going to be good. I've I've walked into breweries that I have heard great things about, sipped their lager because that's the first beer I'm always going to try at your at your brewery, it's going to be your Kolsch, your lager, your Blondale, your simplest beer and said this is not a good beer. And this is not the kind of thing that I trust going forward trying other beers from from that brewery because their 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 stripped down beer was not very good in my opinion or had all flavors. So th- there's no blanket statements. It it sounds like we're making blanket statements because we're making a statement in general, but it doesn't apply to every single situation. It can't. No- nothing can. We're making duvet statements. Uh, <laughs> wow. Okay. Okay. So, so Joel, are, are you, uh, Joel, are you, are are you on board yet? I mean, we just went off into an entire recipe thing. By the way, I love that. That's a conversation that I don't think we've had specifically. But did that jog anything for you? Or are you now ready to start? start to talk about how this industry has changed you or just going to eat pretzels? <laughs> no, I'm all out of pretzels, unfortunately. <laughs> but um, no, I, I think gum. I trust me, I'll get to the gummies in a bit. Um, <laughs> but I, I do feel like some of that banter started to maybe peel back a few of the more papery layers of the mental onion uh, I'm trying to process here. Uh, but 
I guess you could say, yeah, maybe it, it, it infected other areas in the sense that, you know, like you guys talked about cooking and everything. Um, infected. I love the term. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. go ahead. In fact, um, it's good. But it's... Fuck, how do I explain this? The... I mean, Christ, I can't boil spaghetti without thinking, like, I wish I had some firm caps so this shit stops fucking boiling over the sides. <laughs> you know? Sometimes I want to bring home, like, a cap full of firm cap to fucking throw in the pasta water. But anyway... um, I think being in a creative career for the first time, um, it helped me socially. I think I'm a better public speaker because I've had to do so many tours over the years. Um, I think having to create things from scratch from the ground up and be awarded for them has been very rewarding. I mean, I have mentioned this many times on here before that, you know, I used to just sit in a fucking cubicle and, you know, would go to these social gatherings and someone would say, oh, what do you do? And I just would change the subject basically because I didn't want to talk about it, let alone think about it and had no good or interesting answer to offer. And, you know, now you tell people, oh, I brewed Barrel of Monks, and their fucking eyes light up. They're like, oh, I've heard of that place, right? Yeah, you know, I mean, every time I go to my doctor, she fucking raves about the place. So, you know, it's always a cool talking point and, you know, helps keep things interesting in a social setting because uh, I never had that before. Yeah, obviously, my uh, circle of friends is, has grown dramatically over the years, Um you know, there was a time in my 20s where I literally had zero friends. Um, I had uh, I had a lot of, like, real... I had a very close-knit, tight group of friends, like, in my very late teens. And they didn't like when I started dating, who is now my wife. And that all kind of fell apart. So I was, I was kind of without friends for a minute. And uh, it was great to get into the beer scene here not professionally yet because we really didn't have any breweries but just meeting up with everybody and and finding genuinely nice cool people who were smart and funny and interesting and and shared a common interest i mean that was everything um and uh you know shit like that um you know i i feel more analytical because brewing you know i mean i've kind of always been that way but with brewing things have to be so precise and you have to pay so much attention to detail because one little slip up could ruin an entire batch of beer and um you know that kind of translates to you know other things like cooking or, or if i'm building something or whatever it is um and then there's uh something i just totally fucking forgot and i'm brain farting so never mind uh, if i come up with it again i'll let you know please oh i know what it is uh working at a brew pub for three years completely ruined the dining out experience for me uh i i, I you know i know i was getting a little positive there but there is this other aspect i mean <laughs> bring it i back. was out to dinner with my wife uh last weekend and i saw a waiter collect dirty glasses from a table that was being bust by sticking all his fucking fingers in all the glasses. And I just wanted to stab somebody. I mean, I watch and, and like do like a mental time check of like, all right, how long has it been since they fucking, you know, haven't bust that table? Like people could be sitting there and there could be profits being made, you know, food could be getting ordered and served and sold and, you know, I, I like I can't go into a fucking restaurant now without like analyzing everything like I'm fucking John Taffer. Is 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 there a reason you go to stabbing so quickly? <laughs> is that normal or Well, people aren't big on guns these days. <laughs> it's okay. It, it's more sporting. I will say that. It's much more sporting in general to, to you gotta get really close to somebody and especially if you're using one of those like little knives off your leatherman that you have for for brewing. 
it, it's uh, it's really tough to do. I've tried. Yeah, I mean, look. Did you just pull you, up a Leatherman? When, That's yeah. very great. Yeah, <laughs> it's right here on my desk. <laughs> yeah, when you really sink a, a rusty brewing knife blade into the chest of uh, a random <laughs> uh, restaurant employee, Let him I finish. Mean, there's, there's a connection that, that gets made there. You, you feel something. You stare in their eyes as you watch their humanity yes. leave their body? Yes. And it's it's a beautiful moment between two people. <laughs> you know, all all jokes so aside, I we're, actually we're told a David Lynch <laughs> thing now. This ladies and gentlemen, the like. ladies and gentlemen, the darkest moment in the history of the United We <laughs> Drink podcast. <laughs> well, you know, all jokes aside, I did tell my wife uh that night uh, that I was just referring to. And I know Mike saw this on Twitter. But I kept seeing this fucker on a motorcycle <laughs> running red lights. And it wasn't like, oh, I think I can beat this yellow. He was like sitting at a red light going, ah, you know what? I'm done waiting. And would just go through the intersection. And the funny thing was, we would just catch up to him because he would just keep catching the next red light. So, and he would just keep going through them again. And I pointed out to my wife and I go, I got to be honest with you, there are a lot of people who should be grateful to you that they're still alive. Because if it weren't for my saint of a wife and my kids and having something to live for, I'd probably just be fucking mowing down people in traffic constantly. Back to you guys. <laughs> um. Where where do we go from there? Uh, I, I I don't I don't know if there's a place to go. As one Axel Rose would uh, would ask. Um, apparently, you no you don't have the answer. No, I thought you were setting yourself up and, to and, answer your own question. I I was trying I was trying to you know give myself some time and. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I really don't know how to kind of pivot from there. So well, look, we're we're forty minutes in. Why don't we finally discuss what we're drinking? Drank. <laughs> <laughs> no, listen. We we can discuss what we're drinking, but I do want to mention this. There are there's many people who listen to our podcast that know Joel personally, at least uh, in a digital way through his. Uh, social media accounts but to hear him speak you really would think that we as friends are in somewhat danger on a regular <laughs> basis mostly me because i work with him every day and by work with him i, I joel does the work i i sit on my butt and do emails but uh, i want to reiterate he's a freaking softy I mean, Joel's one of the kindest, sweetest people I think I've ever met in my life. And I don't want to tear down the the facade that you've built around yourself. And I know that in your brain, you're murdering people on a daily basis. But in reality, he's one Batman. of the better one of the better people I know. Do you know those scenes? And it's often in comedies. Uh, I can give you a quick example, like um, uh, analyze this when he is speaking to and see he's a uh, billy crystal is this psychotherapist and he's uh dealing with this kind of moronic uh patient uh that he's therapizing and therapizing. he starts therapizing? like <laughs> therapizing i believe that's a word i could be wrong i wish i hadn't used it i'm sorry <laughs> that's my, also the name of this episode my, do you <laughs> my wife is a it's a professor is a has a doctorate in mental health counseling and the first thing i'm going to do when i leave this show is walk out into the front room and say therapizing <laughs> and see if she's got anything for you but please though go on yeah it, and please one word. of you give me what the spelling of that is <laughs> Therapy, drop the Y, add I-Z-I-N-G. It is a word. <laughs> anyway. Okay. So, no, it's it's one of those scenes where the person starts, like, freaking out and screaming at the person and just sort of succumbing to all of their, you know, tendencies to just lose their shit and say what they actually think or do what they actually want to do. And then it, like, cuts right back to reality and they haven't done any of those things. I hate that shit. Like, I wish they were doing it. 
every time they cut back to reality and like they didn't really, you know, stab somebody or yell at them. I'm like, God, well, why didn't you do that? Like, this is fiction. We can do this in fiction. Yeah, there's there's plenty of, of those in cinema. Uh, Does that answer your question, Phil? <laughs> <laughs> You see what happens? <laughs> Just nicely trying to give us a show topic, and this is the reward. Are you sure you still want to be on the Slack channel, Phil? Bill? <laughs> Whatever your name is. Um, so I drank um, two low fills of our uh, High Ridge IPA. Uh, the one that I think doesn't need C20. And uh, I feel like I need another one after this. <laughs> but uh, Kevin, what did you have? So I've had a couple beers here. Uh, the one I'm drinking right now is our Cosmic Lighthouse uh, Double IPA. And I have to say, this is fast. You don't becoming... have to. No, I have to. <laughs> I have to say, Mike, that's why I said it. It's uh, show me welling the up. It's welling up inside of me. This is fastly becoming one of the my favorite beers that we've ever done. So well made, so well balanced. I'm really impressed by what uh, you and Ralph did with this beer, Joel. Uh, I'm really proud of this beer. It's I'm I'd, I'd happily put this up on there up against any hazy double IPA out there, Joel. Question, is Kevin a Hayes bro now? No, no, I would never. <laughs> the The fact that he drinks plain polar <laughs> completely <laughs> offsets the, the ratio here. One can. Like, you know those people who go to fucking Treehouse with a hand truck and they walk out with like 47 cases of shit like they're a fucking moving company? Like... One can of Polar Plain Seltzer offsets that entire Haysboro purchase. <laughs> it feels anyway, like you've done I'm the drinking, math. Uh, Ritz Lemon Lime Seltzer. Uh, this is not Polar. I had to get some of this shit when there was no sparkling water on sale at Publix. And, uh, you know, ounce for ounce, it is the best uh, deal. It's not the best seltzer, but it's not bad either. Fucking... Tomorrow, Polar goes back on sale at Publix and listen to this bullshit. It's now <laughs> buy two, get one free at the price of six forty five each. So it used to be like, I don't know, four twenty nine, and then it would be buy one, get one free. So a twelve pack would be like two and change. So now if you buy two at six forty five each and then get one free, your per twelve pack price is 430. So it's horseshit. And Math. I have to now buy all my sparkling water at BJ's fucking two towns away. <laughs> Welcome to Boynton Beach. Uh, I, I just want to mention the BJ's that BJ's I... you're going to? What? Are you going to the <laughs> BJ's in Boynton? Is that No, Parkland. Oh. Okay. Uh, Coconut Creek, whatever it is. So I, I'm drinking some Kirkland le lime sparkling water as well. So that's my other, my non-alcoholic drink over here. Just so you know that I'm not drinking a plain, unflavored sparkling water. I did not make that mistake again, Joel, because I'm trying to dodge your ridicule. Well, I was going to ask if you added the lime. Uh, the can is green, <laughs> is all I can say. Uh, hey, uh, Liquid Death is BOGO. Shout out to our affiliate or whatever they're oh, really? calling themselves. Tomorrow. My, okay, I gotta go. My my Publix has not had uh, the sparkling version for a while. The last few times I've gone in, they haven't had it. They have added the flavors of lime and mango, uh, and they have the still, but they have not had just the regular... Uh, uh, unflavored sparkling one, but I I've been impressed by my Publix, my tiny little Publix that I shop at. Uh, carrying now 
four skews of liquid death when they started with one and I felt like I was the only person who bought it. I was ID'd for it a number of times and just recently had last time I bought it. The cashier goes, huh, I used to think that this was beer. And I'm like, yeah, I used to get ID'd for it. He's like, I probably did that to you. I'm sorry. That makes no sense to me because I feel like the only time they ID you is when the register prompts them to because they've scanned a SKU that is marked for 21 and up. Exactly. The beer usually pops up something on the the register saying, like, ask for ID. But <laughs> for whatever reason, I had multiple cashiers just go, ID, please. I'm like, it's it's water. ID, please. I'm like, okay. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that sounds like some sort of training failure just let, let me know when that happens next time i'll fucking straighten them out <laughs> <laughs> just, just and, don't and here i here i was thinking that my mother was the only one uh, who i knew that worked for Publix. joel just do us a favor don't bring your knife <laughs> we don't want you to be you know prompted or tempted uh, I, I feel like if it were in the grocery store, there's there's so many fun weapons available. Like, just, <laughs> imagine you know hitting someone over the head with a loaf of fucking rye bread, especially theirs. Um, <laughs> uh, now, and all now, of those avocados—they're never ripe. Uh, <laughs> now I'm just imagining Joel going to every single situation and just looking at the things around him. Is what can I take someone down with? Well, um, imagine me wearing my silly rainbow mirrored fucking mask, walking into a public. I don't and have swinging, to imagine that. I have seen it. Swinging a couple loaves of bread like uh, they're nunchucks, like I'm a Ninja Turtle. I would film that and happily put that on our Barrel Among social media accounts. So let's do it, Joel. I, I, it has nothing to do with beer. In any way, shape, or form, but I have a feeling it would be the most popular thing that we can possibly do. You just put your logo on there and, and like, over him as he's moving, and there you go. Well, I mean, in, in, in fairness, most breweries, what they do on social media, and yeah, what they make has nothing to do with beer. So it would go right along with the whole trend. Oh, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, Take that, industry. <laughs> Um, all right. So, uh, I don't know if that answered Phil's question. It probably did it, but I'm just impressed that Joel got there eventually <laughs> after you and I poured our hearts out. Joel came to grips with his mental block and, and really dove deep into his subconscious and, and, and pulled out some real answers he they were realized, scary answers but they were answers he realized that there is no possibility for phil to ask a question that is really in depth and takes a whole lot of brain knowledge to think about wow <laughs> i you know it, it's very much a representation of of me in a uh, uh kind of conversational uh social setting anyway because even though i said earlier that uh you know having to do tours and 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 that kind of stuff has has helped my public speaking and all that um as i say um and you know a thousand times on this podcast uh <laughs> i still like like if the three of us were sitting around a table i'd probably not be volunteering much until prompted or if other views are offered and then I have a counterpoint or something to add on to that. I mean, that's, that's kind of my style. I don't like, like when you guys tell me about, you know, like coming up with comedy material or whatever, like for me, it's, it's so conversational and off the cuff and, and spontaneous that to actually prepare anything or like really think it out is, is almost a lot harder for me. So, or but, when you know, Kevin just having... talks about how much he likes Billie Eilish. <laughs> I, I've I've warmed up to Billie Eilish a, a little bit. Oh, a little bit. interesting, interesting. You know, I fuck. I I walked into my daughter's room one night just to check on her. You know, it was like late night. You're going to bed. You're checking on everyone and stuff. And she, oh fuck, this is gonna make me cry. I 
I checked on her and she had her little like Alexa thing playing music to go to sleep and it was so low volume. But you could hear this Billie Eilish song. I don't know what it's called. It's a very low, soft song. And just hearing that and looking at my daughter's little innocent face while she slept. I mean, it was like, it was just one of those things where, you know, if there were a particular smell in the room at the time, like from a food or like, like any sensory thing would have been ingrained in my, my mind from that moment. So, um, you know, and and I heard a really interesting interview with her on Howard Stern. So, you know, I mean, look, I, I still think her vocals sound very, um, fentanyl, uh, inspired, (laughs) like, like, like a lot of opiate, a lot of opiates are done in the recording of this music, but otherwise, you know, not, not as bad as I originally thought. We made advancements here tonight. We made a breakthrough. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Joel started wanting to stab people. Now he's accepting teen pop stars. <laughs> I think that's as good of a place as any to go into last calls. Uh, this is the point in the show where we give each other an unspecific amount of time to voice whatever it is that we want to. Unopposed, unobjected, we don't discuss it any further after that until the shows off the air uh but for that let's throw to the guy who wasn't here last episode you you know you gotta start it joel all right well look i experienced so much in the last month like i said both positive and negative i mean i want to talk about things in entertainment like you know, the new Thor or the Stranger Things finale or the George Carlin documentary or the new Bill Burr comedy special or, uh, you know, seeing the Grand Canyon for the first time or, or, you know, what Sedona was like. I mean, there are a million things I want to get into, but, you know, as I'm sure everyone's aware, things have been quite difficult in the nation recently and, you know, people are stressed and you know supreme court making some very unsavory decisions on things and uh i guess my kind of overall theme here would be that uh if i could just say something to all the white women out there it's um you've got to go uh it's it's enough of you and your tweets and your bullshit and your recording uh rants from the driver's seat of your car and your performative uh fucking activism on social media and there's there's two examples that i saw today that just overruled anything else i want to talk about i'm going to read these two tweets to you really quickly the first one is from annika molesworth who said she posted two selfies one of her uh, holy christ i mean It looks like she's out in the fucking desert somewhere. She's got, like, an Indiana Jones hat on and, like, a denim fucking crew neck t-shirt. And the first one is kind of just looking kind of frowny and and looking down toward the ground. And then the other one is, like, looking straight at the camera, like, more confidence and everything. And the text of the tweet is, I am causing climate change. And with my fear, grief, responsibility, determination, hope, and vision, I will do all I can to help fix this problem. Hashtag climate crisis. Hashtag climate emergency. Hashtag climate action. Hashtag climate solutions. Sent from my iPhone. Then we have Coral Reefer 420, who also posted two fucking photos one is taking a huge bong rip and then the other is blowing out the smoke so you can't even see her face and she's wearing a see-through dress where her tits are exposed except for the nipples being covered by pot leaves and the text of this one says 
If you're a stoner still using the term marijuana, it's always a good time to switch to the word cannabis. Marijuana is a word invented by English-speaking Americans to sound as if it came from a foreign land to more easily stoke racists and xenophobes' fears. Holy fucking shit. Like, you are doing less than nothing to help anyone. You're sitting there posting your little sexy selfies with the fucking bong rip and all the immature fucking weed clothing uh you clearly don't believe in commas based on the text of your tweet there's no punctuation whatsoever it's just god fucking awful and you're just it i fucking hate the language police i hate the fucking language police and like coming off this carlin documentary i have even more just rage for them Using the word marijuana does not hurt anyone, regardless of the fucking origins. There's nobody right now who's like, what, marijuana? That's for, you know, brown people or whatever the fuck she's implying here. This is insanity to me. These are people who are just performing online while actually doing less than fucking nothing to help anyone. Getting rid of the word marijuana doesn't help anyone who's sitting in jail right now because of racist drug laws. It just fucking doesn't. Uh, Tweeting selfies in the desert from your iPhone full of conflict minerals made in a building that's equipped with suicide nets does fucking nothing for climate change. So, white women, your time's up. It's over. You can go now. Thank you very much. Uh, no, no, I'm not following that. I I can, have the say on this, and uh, can 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 Joel be the only one who does a last call this week? Rock paper. <laughs> um. <laughs> all right, I'll I'll go. Um. So recently, I've been doing a lot of bit, a lot of thinking about. Um, what my life and career looks like after beer, because let's be honest, this isn't, this, this can't be a sustainable end all for me. Maybe it is for other people, but it can't be for me. Um, this industry doesn't care a whole lot about pay for hard work, um, expects a lot of extra work, um, unpaid, uncared for. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's gotten me thinking, what do I do when I feel like my time has run out on this? And I would be lying if I didn't say, I don't know what the fuck I would do, even though I can look at what I have done in this industry in the past 10 years, and there's not a whole lot that I can say that I don't know how to do. I know how to make beer practically from the start to its finish. I know how to put it into a package. I know how to sell it, how to market it, how to design labels for it, how to pay taxes on it. Um, how those labels are supposed to actually be uh, set up and worded. I know how to take photographs of it. I know how to edit said photographs. I know how to do a whole lot of things in this industry. And yet, when I think about what do I do outside of this industry, I am a fucking imposter. And I don't fucking know shit about fuck or fuck about shit. And I really don't know what to fucking do. And, but then luckily I have good people in my life, like my wife, like these two guys who I do this podcast with, who help affirm to me that I have skill. I know shit about fuck and fuck about shit. And I could be an integral part to a lot of different businesses. Um, and I, I, I think about that. 
possibly way more than I should be as a almost 40 year old dude who has almost nine month old twins and just trying to wonder how I can support a family and not drive myself insane and do something that I feel is beneficial to the world. Not the beer is. Um, I don't know where this is actually going, but this is something that's been on my mind for a while. And I just wanted to kind of put it out there. Um, I love making beer. I love making stuff that is around beer, photos, labels, POS, uh, lots of different things related to this. I like being creative. I like making things. Um, I don't know if I can actually go back to a job of fielding calls from angry people who their websites are down because they fucked up some of their source code somewhere or whatnot, and they think it's all my fault. I also don't know if I can work in a place where I'm being creative about something that I don't really like. Like, do I want to do creative for pharmaceuticals? Do I want to be creative for fucking big, like, meat packing plants? I don't fucking know. But it's it's people like these two guys who I sit on this podcast with every couple weeks and my wife and other close friends that help me remember that I I get to make something that I care about and get to be creative to a certain extent. But it's also has made me realize that my career doesn't have to define who I am. And uh, just because I work a job that maybe doesn't uh, appease me doesn't make it me. I've for too long made Mike, Mike loves beer and the, that beer is a part of me and it doesn't need to be. I can be a creative person and, and a creative outlet without beer, without something that necessarily is something that I enjoy. Um, and with that, uh, my talking therapy session of this is over and, uh, thank you. Uh, good night. Uh, Kevin. I got a dog. My family fucking really oh, got sorry. a dog <laughs> and we went and picked the dog up today. And I have a four, I have a four and a half year old child named Jad, and he had been asking for a dog for the last six months or so, like really saying, when are we going to get a dog? And I said to myself, well, we'll get a dog for the family when Jad is really interested and bought in and can remember it because I I got a dog just at the time where I could start really making memories and kind of grow up with the dog. And I I I love dogs everyone's dogs mike's dog i love uh, and we went to a uh, a uh, a place called i heart i heart rescue something of that nature down in uh, fort lauderdale uh, I, I heart animal rescue of course sorry uh down in, in fort lauderdale and picked up a sweet little dog brindle in color uh, a mutt with a, a bad eye can't see out of one eye is blind about seven to nine months old they think and we brought her home today and i'm really happy to have a new member of the family and she's so nervous and was found you know living in a bush and can't walk on a leash is super nervous around everybody but just thrilled to have a new member of the family and to have a dog in the house and have a a dog for my child to grow up with and for us it's it's been a long time since i've had a dog in my life and i'm really excited about it i'm excited for you uh kevin do you want to plug anything uh, there's a brewery in Boca Raton 
Bear of the Monk Joel, Brewing. Do you want to plug There's anything? probably <laughs> something that's coming up at some point in the near future uh, related to that. Uh, don't cut me off, Mike. <laughs> okay, this is this might not be last call, but you still can't cut me off. <laughs> so go check that out and keep uh, logging on or checking out our videos on YouTube where you get to hear me and Joel banter and really lampoon the craft beer industry with our old favorite Fridays. Now, Joel. Well, since Kevin plugged all the uh, usual brewery stuff, <clears throat> and he has a dog now, I will just shout out uh, Calusa Veterinary Center, I believe it's called. It's, it's right near the brewery, Kevin. Um, I had to deal with them, uh, not to put a damper on what Kevin just said, but uh, we had to have ours euthanized while we were on vacation on our anniversary. And then after we came back, uh, I had to bury it. So um, just wanted to mention to Kevin that, uh, you know, if uh, he needs, uh, Calusa was very great with us and uh, really nice place, very uh, sweet people. They even sent us a card. Um, so, and, and I know my brother takes his dogs there too. So, uh, if you need a vet, I recommend them to you, Kevin, and to everyone else. Uh, I don't know. Enjoy Arby's. Uh, adopt, please. Like, please adopt animals. That's my uh, little plug for for that. Um, and then for the show, uh, please follow us on our social media at United We Drink on Twitter at United We Drink Pod on Instagram, but who the fuck cares about Instagram because their fucking algorithm is terrible and they just kill brands now. Fuck you, Meta. Um, other than that, you can listen to this podcast on a bunch of places that aren't them, such as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts. Amazon Music. I know. I just said a whole bunch of other big company names. Um, but whatever. That's the way the fucking cookie crumbles. Um, we'll be back in a couple weeks and we're gonna have we're gonna have a guest. I'm not gonna say who right now, but we're gonna we're gonna start talking to people who aren't us and get some opinions about things from not us. So that's gonna be fun. That's gonna be exciting. Uh, we'll be back here in a couple weeks with that. And for everyone else, thank you. Be cool to one another and cheers. 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 Cheers.